Yes, so as uh, the chair has alluded to, this term ECP, the economic calculation problem, is one that you won't necessarily come across uh, unless you go online a lot, um, particularly if you visit uh, socialist uh, YouTube channels like our own. And there you'll find under the uh, video in the comments section, lots of right wing trolls saying ECP, ECP. And uh, in fact, I don't think we're being live streamed, but when this video goes up, I imagine underneath that video will be lots of right wing trolls saying ECP, ECP. Um, they probably Googled the term and accidentally stumbled across a, a Marxist perspective on the, on the question. And now it's seen by libertarian zealots and defenders of capitalism as one of the key arguments against socialism and in favor of capitalism and the free market. In short, it's the assertion that planning of the economy is impossible uh, due to the immense complexity of the modern economy and that instead we should uh, put our faith uh, in the invisible hand of the market and the so-called dynamism and rigors of competition. Now, in reply to these right-wing trolls, we might suggest that they simply open up a copy of the newspaper today. Or in fact, if they can pull themselves away from the keyboard, head down to the shops and the petrol stations, where they'll find a very fine demonstration of the wonders and efficiency of the so-called free market. What we see is that it's not Hugo Chavez's Venezuela, but Boris Johnson's Britain, where we have you know, basic necessities like food and fuel in shortage and scarcity, where we have 100,000 pigs, I think it is, that are gonna be slaughtered and thrown to waste simply because of the cold logic of profit and the anarchy of the market, where we have hundreds of thousands of empty homes used as vehicles for speculation, meanwhile, a huge housing crisis, where we have uh, the choice this winter between heating and eating, or in the energy sector between blackouts and bailouts. And on a global scale, you see, of course, the massive breakdown of supply chains. You see the, the huge uh, amount of labor shortages across the economy, alongside the threat of mass unemployment. These are the kind of contradictions that we see under the free market. And last, by no means least, of course, is the existential question of the climate catastrophe, whereby capitalism and the free market are literally killing the planet. Now, all of this really highlights the bankruptcy of capitalism, a system of production for profit rather than need. It shows the limits of the market, and it shows why we need to be able to argue for a socialist alternative based on economic planning, public ownership, and workers' control. Now, all of these examples I've just highlighted, they've certainly led the frenzied free marketeers to go a little bit more quiet online and on the streets in recent years. Now, when we're selling the socialist appeal, you don't get quite so many people coming up to you telling you that communism and socialism don't work because it's their system that isn't working. Nevertheless, the fundamental position that they defend, the idea of the efficiency of the market, is the one you will find put forward in economic departments of universities across the world and, of course, in the textbooks that the bourgeois promote as well, where they say that the economy is basically a set of graphs, a set of equations, of mathematical models, and it's some sort of idealized system in their heads which would be in perfect kind of equilibrium and harmony if only it weren't for pesky trade unionists demanding higher wages or central bankers printing too much money or in fact politicians erecting barriers to free trade. Now it's vital therefore that we arm ourselves with the arguments, as I said, to make the case for socialist planning instead of this chaos of capitalism. But most importantly, we need to arm ourselves with an understanding of how capitalism works and how it doesn't and that understanding can only be provided by the ideas of Marxism. Now, this so-called economic calculation debate has been going on for roughly 100 years. And really, you'll see it's a theoretical battle that's waged on one side by the libertarians, with the support of big business and uh, right-wing politicians, of course. And on the other side, you've got socialists of various stripes who've defended socialist planning. Now, it's worth, first of all, going back, really, and looking at the origins of libertarianism, which can trace its theoretical lineage back to something called the Austrian school. And uh, the most famous, infamous, if you like, representatives of the Austrian school were people like Friedrich Hayek and uh, Ludwig von Mises. And they in turn saw themselves really as the inheritors, the true inheritors of the liberal classical economists, the bourgeois econ economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. 
Now, economics as a field of study really emerged with the rise of capitalism, and it was a field known as political economy. And what it saw was thinkers who tried to understand capitalism scientifically. They tried to understand and examine this system of capitalism with its laws and its dynamics. They didn't see it as simply a, a set of mathematical models, an abstract uh, series of equations. And really the high point of this came, as I said, with figures like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, the British economists, who were these kind of liberal enlightenment types who, who themselves reflected the rise of the bourgeoisie and the rise of British capitalism in particular, which was seeking to break open the world market in its own interest. And therefore, the idea of free trade and the free market that Adam Smith promoted was really uh, the interests of the bourgeoisie in Britain that dominated uh, world capitalism at the time. Now, Marx uh, really left off where, uh, or really continued rather, where Ricardo left off in terms of trying to theoretically and scientifically understand the capitalist system. But unlike uh, Ricardo, Marx was trying to put himself at the service, not of the bourgeoisie, but of the rising working, working class movement and the labor movement. He started actually from the same assumptions as David Ricardo and the classical economists, but, in, but developed their ideas further, showing that capitalism was riddled with contradictions, that it was inherently prone to crises because of its own laws and dynamics. The bourgeois economists who followed David Ricardo, therefore, actually had to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They actually had to throw away the scientific materialist method that had been developed uh, by Ricardo and his predecessors. And for that reason, Marx called these people the vulgar economists, because he said now that their job was no longer to try and examine and explain capitalism, but they became mere apologists for capitalism, Marx said. Now, historical developments also played an important role in this. Most notably, obviously, the rise of the organized working class and the international socialist movement. Towards the end of the 19th and early 20th century, you saw the development of huge trade unions, mass trade unions, mass socialist parties, and also the, the, the foundation of the second international, the socialist international, all of which, on paper at least, uh, ascribed to Marxism, to scientific socialism, to revolution. And these social democratic parties by the early 20th century uh, were winning large percentages of the vote in places like Germany and Austria. 20 or 30 percent these workers' parties were winning in elections. The ruling class, therefore, could very much see and sense the threat of this rising workers' movement, and they therefore began an all-out ideological and political offensive. And the, the center of this ideological offensive really happened to be in Austria, particularly the University of Vienna, became the epicenter really of these kind of intellectual attacks. Around the turn of the 20th century, you had the development of kind of positive, positivist uh, philosophy. A man called Ernst Mack, who is a professor at University of uh, Vienna, who, who came up with a, 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 a very subjective idealist philosophy known as imperio-criticism, which started to become uh, quite popular. And Lenin actually felt it so necessary to respond to this philosophy that he wrote the book Materialism and Imperio-Criticism, putting forward uh, a defense of the materialist philosophy. And I don't have time to go into that. I'm sure it's covered uh, and has been covered in other talks this weekend. But Mack and the University of Vienna were then very influential on later philosophical developments like logical positivism, and also particularly people like Karl Popper, another Austrian, who also tried to wage an ideological attack against Marxism, and in particular the idea of historical materialism. But the economic attack of uh, out, coming out of Vienna uh, was waged by figures, uh, and I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this name, I'm sorry in advance to any of the Austrian or Germanic comrades in the room. Uh, it was waged by figures like Jürgen von Baum Bauach. Anyone? No? All right, good. Uh, and a man called Karl Menger. Um, and that's the last time I'm going to try and say their names today. Um, they waged the opening shots against Marxism, against so scientific socialism as it was known. Their opening shots were fired at what's called the labor theory of value, which is really the foundations of Marxist economics. It explains uh, the, the law of value, which in turn underpins all of the dynamics really of, uh, of the capitalist system. And in place of the labor theory of value, 
they had their own theory called marginal utility theory, which again was a very subjectivist, very idealist perspective based on individual consumer preferences. And this uh, subjectivist theory hadn't just developed out of Vienna, it actually emerged out of other vulgar economists, people like William Stanley Jevons in Britain and Leon Volrus in uh, Switzerland. But it was starting to become popular amongst these bourgeois academics um, as an alternative to the labor theory of value. Now, it's worth pausing here and asking exactly what is the labor theory of value? Now, it's really a theory that can be traced all the way back to Aristotle if you want to go far enough. I'm not going to do that today. Um, but it's the idea, fundamentally, that it's the application of labor in the process of production that makes things valuable. Nature gives us uh, a certain amount of wealth for free, if you like, but it's the application of labor that creates new value within society. And this was a theory that was actually developed by the classical economists, by people like Smith and Ricardo. It was a centerpiece of their, uh, of their ideas. And it was then also the foundations, as I said, for Marxist economic ideas also. But the classical view of, la of the labor theory of value Marx showed was very incomplete. It was, uh, it was really imbued uh, with all of the kind of individualism that you get because of the, the liberal traditions and the liberal uh, perspective, the bourgeois perspective that Adam Smith and David Ricardo were coming from. For them, the economy was little more than an addition of lots of individuals. You know, you look at one man working on an island, you look at a lot of their writings about Robinson Crusoe slaving away on his island. And, you know, the value for, for, for them was to say, okay, well, um, you know, a Robinson Crusoe is stranded on his desert island. He, uh, he makes a raft out of some trees. He gets some coconuts down from some other trees. It takes half a day to make the raft. It might take half a day to get 10 coconuts. So 10 coconuts are worth one raft. That was effectively the kind of very individualistic viewpoint of the labor theory of value uh, in terms of the, the amount of labor time going into these different processes, these different commodities. Uh, that was really uh, how, you, how the, the, the classical economists saw the question. And the economy was just scaled up. If, and, and you know, these individuals on a desert island might meet someone else and trade with them, and that would be the basis for their trading, is how much individual labor time had gone into these, uh, these processes, into these commodities. But obviously that's not what capitalism actually looks like. None of us are trading directly with each other in barter. We, we go and earn a wage to, and we use that wage, uh, that money to go and buy other commodities. And we don't then approach other individual sellers. We, we, we go onto Amazon probably or, uh, or other online uh, stores. And we're confronted not with someone's subjective preferences, but with an objective market price that confronts us. And, uh, and in that sense, Marx said, uh, the, the labor theory of value had to be developed. Nevertheless, he took the basic premise of uh, the labor theory of value, which is that labor is the source of all new value, and he developed it uh, on this basis. He explained that it's not individual labor time that makes uh, commodities valuable. Commodities being products for exchange, I should have uh, mentioned earlier, as opposed to things that we produce and consume ourselves, those aren't commodities. The capitalism is, is a system of generalized commodity production and exchange, Marx says. The, everything is produced for sale, for exchange. And the, the question is how much do you exchange of one thing for another? That's really what the question of value uh, is all about. But he said it's not individual labor time that determines uh, how much things are exchanged for each other, but socially necessary labor time. Uh, that's what makes commodities valuable. In other words, it's the average labor time uh, that goes into a commodity given certain technological or historical conditions. And this idea of Marx of socially necessary labor time, the labor theory of value, was then what underpinned all his other uh, developments, he writes in, in Capital and his other economic writings. In particular, the theory of exploitation, i.e. the fact that profits come from surplus value, and surplus value is, in effect, the unpaid labor of the working class. There is a, a profit is produced in the course of the working day or week because the capitalist pays the worker back less than the value of what that worker produces. The, the wages uh, that the worker gets for their labor power, this commodity that they sell, are less than the value that they are producing in the course of the day. And that difference is surplus value that is then divided up amongst the capitalists in terms of profit, rent, and interest. 
Now, this law of value, in turn, explains all the other dynamics, as I said. It's, it's, it explains why there's a drive to intensify uh, labor, to, to, to squeeze more work out of the, the working class, extending the hours of the working day. Why the capitalist will raise productivity by investing in machinery and technology, again, to try and uh, outcompete the, the competitors, to lower the, 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 the value of their own commodities. To invest and to accumulate and to expand and to grow, all of these come from the labor theory of value. And most importantly, it also explains why you see crises of capitalism, crises of overproduction, because the working class cannot afford to buy all of the goods that capitalism is producing. Therefore, there's always production outstripping the limits of the market. Now, the Austrians sought to attack Marxism at what they perceived to be its weak spot. In particular, as I said, the labor theory of value. They believed that if they could undermine uh, this foundation, they thought the whole of the rest of Marxist theory would just come crumbling down, and with it, the whole socialist movement, which is a bit of an idealistic idea in itself. You know, they thought, as these kind of academic bourgeois types, if you could disprove the theory, then suddenly the whole workers' movement would just give up and go home, which obviously it shows you know, their view of history being one of great men and great ideas being what drive society rather than people's uh, you know, struggle over their, their class interests. Now, they made various critiques of the labor theory of value and of, and of Marxism. Most of these can be really put down to a misunderstanding or a purposeful confusion, if you like, of the difference between labor and labor power, which I won't touch on that much, but it, the difference there is labor is what the working class produces. Labor power is the ability to work. It's, uh, it's, it's what the capitalist buys, their the time in a day, a week, a month, and, and it's, they then try and squeeze as much labor out of the labor power that they bought as possible. That was one of the uh, misunderstandings. The other was, and the primary one, was over the difference between value and price. Now, Marx didn't deny the idea of prices. He didn't deny that there is a market out there with supply and demand that pushes prices around. Uh, and, but the thing is, Marx pointed out that these prices were like some sort of kind of fuzzy noise, if you like. You know, that's what we see, the noise. The, the, but underneath that noise, there was some sort of signal that these prices were oscillating around. In other words, behind this kind of seeming randomness and chaos and accidental movement of prices, there is something uh, lawful. There is an order. There is a necessity, if you like, behind these accidents. Marx uses the analogy with gravity, the law of gravity which governs the celestial motion of the planets. You know, we see the mo motion of the planets, but we know that behind that motion lies laws of motion, that, that gravity and, and, uh, and, and mo motion that we can, um, we can understand and, 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 uh, and develop into laws and theories to explain further motion, to explain further phenomena in nature. And it's the same with prices and value. We see the market prices, that's what we're confronted with, but below that appearance there is something more fundamental that is, uh, mo that is causing the motion of these prices on the market. And that is the idea of value that is determined, as I said, by socially necessary labor time. The socially necessary labor time congealed within a commodity which can be broken down into the dead labor, that is the, the labor embodied within raw materials, means of production, and uh, tools and so forth that go into production, pass on their value to the new commodity. Or there's also the living labor, the new labor that's added in the process of production, um, which is what creates new value. And what uh, supply and demand do is to push prices above and below this value. And that's really the case most of the time. In, in, in reality, you never really see prices equal exactly to their values. There's always distortions, there's always monopolies. You know, the real world is not the perfect idealized models of the, uh, of the capitalists and the, and the academics. On average though, you can say over time, you see some sort of prices that, that, that can be you know, smoothed out if you like. And also over time, you see prices and values gen tending to go down because of technological developments reducing the amount of social necessary labor time that needs to go into them. And therefore, on average, when supply and demand uh, match, if you like, something else has to explain why certain things are more valuable than others. Why is it that on average, a pen will be worth less than a car, unless it's a really old banger, although secondhand cars are actually, weirdly, more expensive than, for, than uh, new cars these days. Not gonna go into that, but anyway, uh, we can discuss that later. 
if people really want. But the point is, most of the time, uh, unless you've got a really expensive pen or a really shitty car, uh, your pen is going to be less valuable than the car. Now, um, uh, for these reasons, therefore, we've got to understand uh, the idea of value underpinning prices. The marginal utility theorists, on the other hand, they only see the appearance. They, they only see the superficial, which is the prices. One might say they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Now, they also really just focus on consumption. They don't really look at production at all. For them, everything value is just something subjective. It's a purely subjective uh, quantity uh, or quality, really, uh, based on the utility of a commodity. So the usefulness to the consumer compared to other commodities. They talk about the margin, i.e. the idea of uh, you know, how useful is a commodity compared to the next other commodity you could get to perform the same sort of function. Now again, Marx didn't d deny the idea that things have to have a usefulness and a utility. Uh, he said, you know, unless there is uh, some sort of use to society, then something will not be sold and therefore it cannot be taken to the market. It will therefore have no price and no exchange value. So use value is a precondition to exchange value. But the point is that this exchange value, how much we exchange of one thing for another, has to be it's something relative and it has to be something quantifiable and objective because as i said we're presented not with people's subjective uh, needs you know i don't know on amazon how much the other person really wanted to to have that thing themselves all i know is that there's a price that is through competition averaged out uh, for any given commodity it's something objective that you're confronted with the problem with utility is it's completely arbitrary. It's something completely subjective, and it's also something qualitative. Certain things have different uses. How do you compare the use of one thing to a use of something that might be useful for a different task, or, or you know, that might be useful for one person but not for another? It's completely arbitrary and completely uh, uh, subjective. The only thing Marx said that all commodities, or rather the primary thing he said that they all have in common that makes it possible for them to be compared is the fact that they are uh, products of labor, and in particular, social labor. So in the end, really, you see the marginal utility theorists tying themselves in knots. They created a theory that in reality could explain nothing, because all genuine theory in science has to be based on the discovery of objective laws and dynamics, not analyzing subjective whims. That's not economics, that's not science, that is psychology. Uh, or, or anthropology, which can be sciences in different fields, but not when it comes to the question of, uh, of this uh, question of, of, of uh, exchange of commodities and how capitalism works. The result with marginal utility is a theory, inverted commas, if you can call it that, it's very ahistorical, very abstract, very idealistic, and it basically reduces economics to a certain amount of uh, eternal truths, if you like, laws that are based on so-called human nature. And again, like with Smith and Ricardo, they inherit this, this worst aspect of talking about really abstract examples of a, a man by a waterfall or someone looking for diamonds or you know, a man on an island trading. It's all completely divorced from the realities of capitalism. Most of us are not out hunting for diamonds day in, day out. We're trying to put food on the table. Now, all of that really reflected, uh, Bukharin wrote a, a good uh, analysis of this called uh, the, the economic theory of the leisure class, he said. It, re it re reflected the rise of this rentier economy where you've just got these stockbrokers who are completely divorced from production and they just see, as I said, the superficial, the consumer side of things. Now, on this subjectivist basis, the ruling class couldn't really challenge Marxism. Uh, as I said, it wasn't an explanation for capitalism, it was a mere apology for it. And above all, they couldn't stop the rise of the socialist movement. They were particularly scared, obviously, by uh, the wave of revolutions that broke out in the wake of the First World War, the Russian Revolution, the German Revolution, and others. And also, they were scared by the tendency in this same period towards state planning and towards monopolization and away from private ownership and competition. Even layers of the bourgeois, because of the experiences of the First World War, were coming to round to the idea that a certain amount of state planning would be uh, uh, required and necessary and in indeed preferable. And hence you had a new wave of attacks led by an even more frenzied generation of the Austrian school, uh, particularly led by figures like von Mises, who in the 1920s onwards started to, uh, again, bring up this question uh, of the economic calculation debate. And that's what I'll move on to now. What von Mises tried to say 
is that socialism wasn't something that was right in theory but wrong in practice. But in his words, it was wrong in theory and in practice. That was what he was trying to assert. Again, as I said earlier, because socialist planning was impossible because of the sheer complexity of the economy. So many things to produce and distribute and allocate that only the information provided by price signals through the market could efficiently allocate resources and labor. He said the amount of, uh, of calculation required was too much for any centralized bureaucracy, any computer, and that in fact any state involvement or regulation, he said, uh, von Mises said, would only distort prices and impede the power of the market. Therefore, his conclusion was only the competitive free market, uh, completely free and competitive market would work. Uh, there needed to be no state involvement, no regulation at all. Now, uh, where am I? Yes, okay. Now, what you had, of course, was that very, uh, you know, around the same time that von Mises is talking about this, you have the very concrete examples of, on the one side, the Soviet Union and its huge uh, leaps forward economically. On the other side, the Great Depression. And both of these were huge blows to uh, the extremely abstract and idealistic argument of von Mises. As Leon Trotsky explained in his masterpiece, The Revolution Betrayed, which I really recommend any, if anyone wants to get anything to help them understand uh, this question more, I recommend buying The Revolution Betrayed from the bookstool downstairs, uh, a little plug. Um, he explained in his masterpiece, the, Re uh, the Revolution Betrayed, he talked about the huge economic progress that had been made under the socialist uh, planned economy, or the Soviet planned economy rather, he said, socialism has demonstrated its right to victory, not on the pages of Das Kapital, but in the industrial arena comprising a sixth part of the Earth's surface. It has proven itself not in the language of dialectics, but in the language of steel, cement, and electricity. Now, meanwhile, on the other side, as I said, you had the Great Depression, the Wall Street crash, the deepest crisis in the history of capitalism, which the Austrians had no explanation for, no genuine explanation for, and more importantly, no solution to get out of that crisis. Enter Hayek, who then moves the, the goalposts in terms of this debate in a series of essays. And he says, instead of being impossible, he says socialist planning was technically difficult, less economically efficient, and morally and politically undesirable. Now, to prove his point, he mainly attacked this, this straw man of the, this caricature of socialism in the form of Stalinism and the top-down, bureaucratically planned economy that you had in the Soviet Union at the time. This is, this is uh, late 20s, early 30s uh, that he's writing by this point. And, um, and, and in turn, he also mainly attacked uh, people who fell into two camps. He, he, he based most of his, uh, um, his argument on attacking uh, people like, on the one side, Stalinist apologists like Maurice Dobbs, who is a, an English communist, an economist, and on the other side, these kind of reformist academics like Oscar Lang and Fred uh, Taylor, who are people who succumbed to bourgeois pressure and were advocating a kind of utopian mixed economy, some sort of uh, market socialism, which was a, a weird, permanent, confused blend of uh, centralized planning, common ownership, but capitalist market uh, uh, prices and signals. And the only person really in this all of this confusion who could offer a real defense of socialist planning at the same time as offering an explanation and a criticism of the Soviet bureaucracy was Leon Trotsky in, as I said earlier, The Revolution Betrayed, and also in an excellent article which I recommend uh, comrades reading not so uh, long called The Soviet Economy in Danger, which was written in uh, October 1932. And in these, Trotsky explains the origins of the bureaucracy. He explains in Revolution Betrayed, the bureaucracy was not an inevitable part of socialism, but it was uh, inevitable, if you like, within conditions of economic isolation and backwardness, which is what you saw in the Soviet Union. In other words, because you had scarcity and not superabundance, you had a state bureaucracy that was uh, basically trying to distribute scarcity and allocate uh, resources first and foremost to themselves, you know, and uh, it was it was kind of a policeman of a bread queue that didn't have enough bread uh, was the was the analogy that Trotsky used. 
And he was critical of the, of the bureaucracy. He said it wasn't a, a positive development, but actually something that strangled the socialist planned economy. Socialist planned economy needs the oxygen of workers' democracy, he said. And the bureaucracy was stifling that, leading to all sorts of uh, mad kind of uh, schemes and, and, uh, and results uh, that, that had very destructive effects. That's what he writes in The Soviet Economy in Danger. Now, Hayek, actually, uh, the only time he referred to Trotsky was to take these quotes against the bureaucracy, and rip them out of context, and use them to say, look, there you go, even Trotsky, the leader of the Russian Revolution, doesn't support the socialism and the, and the Soviet Union, which is not true. So Trotsky started from the very clear point position of saying he defended the gains of the Soviet planned economy, but was against the bureaucracy and wanted a genuine uh, workers' democracy. Trotsky says, in, for example, in one of these essays, there is no universal mind that exists that could re register simultaneously all the processes of nature and society in order to draw up a faultless and exhaustive economic plan. He was criticizing the idea of top-down, centralized bureaucratic planning, but Hayek ripped that kind of quote out of context and, uh, and used it to try and justify his argument. So what did Trotsky really have to say on this question? Well, actually, as early as 1922, in his speeches to the Comintern, Trotsky had outlined the problems facing the young Soviet economy. You had the introduction of what was called the NEP, the New Economic Policy, uh, in which uh, the, the Soviets were trying to use prices to stimulate uh, growth and, and, and in certain sectors. And Trotsky actually pointed out that in general, actually, in the transition from socialism to communism, that is from in the transition after the revolution, from scarcity to superabundance, yes, you would need to use market prices and signals in certain places to ascertain where the scarcity was, but to use those signals under the, the, the democratic planned controlled economy to then actually invest in those areas and get rid of that scarcity and bring them in harmony with the rest of the economy. And these points he reiterated actually a decade later or more in Revolution Betrayed in the other article I just mentioned. But Trotsky emphasized that the precondition for using market prices as a signal was that the, the revolution had first of all abolished capitalism, seized the means of production, and put them in the hands of a workers' state. In other words, uh, that you had not bureaucratic planning from the top down, but a genuinely rational, socialist, democratically planned economy based on a system of workers' democracy, control, and management. And the information then of the workers' democracy would gradually replace the price signals and, uh, and it would be used to indicate then in a democratic way with the involvement of work, the working class themselves, they would then decide what uh, needs to be produced. They would have the best knowledge of what could be produced, what needs to be produced, where investment needs to go, how resources and so forth need to be distributed and allocated. All the while, Trotsky emphasizes, using the most advanced technology, logistics, data and planning bequeathed by modern capitalist technique. But the important point that Trotsky really emphasized in all of this is that the problem, so to speak, is not an economic calculation one. You can't simply calculate your way to communism. You can't have a, just a bigger and better computer that is gonna solve the socialist algorithm. The economy is not a set of simultaneous equations to be solved. It's not a computer model that can be programmed from above. Nor is it the abstract, isolated, individualistic uh, model of the economy portrayed by the bourgeois in the textbooks with people, you know, abstract people uh, trading on a desert island. The economy is a living, breathing, dynamic thing composed of flesh and blood. It is us, it's ordinary people, workers, ordinary people trying to put food on the table, a shelter over their head, trying to make ends meet. In that sense, the important point is it's class struggle between the exploiters and the exploited, between the capitalists who are trying to squeeze out more profits and the working class that is seeking to defend their lives and their livelihoods. The real point Trotsky was emphasizing, therefore, is it's not an economic calculation problem, but a political one. It's a class question, a question of power. It's a question of which class owns and runs the means of production and according to what laws on what basis? Is it production for profit or production for need? Now, the fact is that we see immense levels of planning already in the economy today under capitalism, but it's not 
plant socialist planning, it's planning within huge multinationals and monopolies that span the globe. And what you see is actually the most vocal libertarian defenders of the market, the capitalist bosses, they do not leave this sacred market of theirs to decide how they produce within their firm. They don't, they don't leave it to the market to decide how production operates within their own companies. No, they plan everything from the, the farms and the factories through to the shops and the supermarkets. They buy up their suppliers and their distributors to try and extend the amount of planning and control they have over the, the, the over production. And in, as an aside, whilst they talk uh, you know, about liberty and freedom, they are the most brutal dictators inside these factories and firms because they give workers no choice, no freedom, no individuality. Now, the problem is that whilst there's this incredible level of planning within firms, there is still complete anarchy and chaos between them under capitalism. Each of these firms is blindly producing for an unknown market. And that arises from the fact of private ownership and the fact that this is production for individual profit, not under a common plan based on society's needs. Now you see the enormous potential for planning with the modern technology today. In fact, I just want to highlight one, uh, one article here. In a, I think this is from two weeks ago in The Economist. It's called uh, Enter Third Wave, Eco Wave Economics. They talk about the idea of the real-time economy that's developing, where they say, because of modern technology, it's not a question now of planning uh, things but year by year or month by month. But now, big firms like Google, they know what we're doing day by day and minute by minute. You know, they are tracking our every movement and everything that's being produced. It, there's a huge amount of data out there. And policymakers are semi trying to utilize this, but they can't because it's not their data that they control. So instead of us having control over our lives, we see that this data is used to control us. We therefore see the, the, the complete limits of planning under capitalism, because at the end of the day, you can't genuinely plan what you don't control, and you don't control what you don't own. And that's the key question, the question of ownership, which is a class question. Now, all of this planning has arisen because of the objective laws of capitalism. It's a, a tendency that Marx explained in his writings, the tendency towards monopolization, centralization, and concentration of production. We see on the one hand an incredible level of planning across the economy, uh, an incredible level of division of labor as well, an incredible level of specialization. But all of this division of labor then being brought under one roof, so to speak, with this huge uh, concentration of the means of production in the hands of the, these big multinational monopolies and their capitalist owners. Now this is an objective tendency under capitalism. It's not an aberration. It's not a political mistake which is what Hayek and the libertarians assert. Marx explained in Capital and his other economic writings that because of the law of value, precisely because of this, free competition turns into its opposite. It turns into monopoly. If you want a proof of it, go play the board game Monopoly. It was invented to prove precisely this point. Everyone starts out with the same amount and one person gets Mayfair and then wins the game. <laughs> That's my experience of it anyway, and it's normally not me. Um, but the point is that you have the, the most competitive uh, companies gobbling up the weakest ones. You have those who can invest and, and get these bigger and bigger economies of scale, more efficiency. They then squeeze out the smaller firms from the market. And when there's a crisis, they gobble up all of the, the firms that go bankrupt. That is the objective tendency under capitalism. And it's those same laws of capitalism that lead to crises of uh, overproduction. And that's really the important point that we see, that it's not socialism, but capitalism that neither works in theory nor in practice. In Capital, Marx actually starts from the exact same assumptions as Ricardo and Adam Smith and the classical economists. He starts actually by assuming the kind of ideal capitalism that Hayek and the libertarians want. They want a, a, a capitalism where there's no distortions, no monopolies, uh, where, where there's complete freedom of supply and demand. Marx assumes that in his analysis as his starting point. But the point is, he says that even on that basis, even with these assumptions, the laws of capitalism are, are such that you inherently see crises of overproduction due to the nature of where profits come from. And that's very easy to demonstrate. I'm going to do it one, one minute. 
Cal and I are going to be rational entrepreneurs, okay? Because we're told everything is rational in economics. Now, I'm going to employ you guys on this half of the room. On this half, Cal's going to employ the other half of the room. That's already an assumption because, in reality, probably quite a few of you are unemployed and uh, haven't got any job. But let's just assume that half and half are employed for me and Cal. Now, I'm very rational. I'm going to pay you guys here as little as possible in order to boost my profits. Cal, hopefully, will be paying you guys over there as much as possible to buy all the things that uh, you guys are producing with your blood, sweat, and tears. Cal's also a very clever, uh, rational capitalist, so he's doing the same, pushing down your wages, trying to boost his profits, hoping you guys are getting paid a lot on this side. Everyone here, I'm sure, can see the overall result. Everyone's wages are getting driven down. And whilst in theory we should be able to make lots of profits, we can't sell the goods that we're producing. The whole system grinds to a halt. That's the, that's the organic crisis of capitalism you saw in 2008 in, in the Great Depression. And what does this create? Does it create efficiency? No, it creates enormous waste. We see mass unemployment, the most scandalous waste of uh, human uh, potential. You see idle factories. You see the destruction, not the development of the productive forces. And uh, this all leads to a situation not of genuine scarcity, but of poverty amidst plenty. Look at what Marx says in the Communist Manifesto. You have fear of devastation, not because there's too little, but because there's too much, Marx says. And, and Trotsky makes the same point in Revolution Betrayed. He says, the fundamental evil of the capitalist system is not the extravagance of the possessing classes, however disgusting that may be in itself, but the fact that in order to guarantee its right to extravagance, the bourgeois maintain its private ownership of the means of production, thus condemning the economic system to anarchy and decay. That's the point. Even when everything and everyone is behaving rationally, that's precisely when you end up with a system that is irrational for the whole of society uh, as a whole. In, you know, in other words, even when, or rather you could say exactly when capitalism is behaving as it should, that's precisely when it's not working. That's what the Austrian school can never really explain. Why does capitalism go into these periodic crises. Instead, they entertain themselves with these red herring debates about trying to allocate scarce resources. But we don't have scarce resources. We have a superabundance. We have immense productive forces. The real question is how do we put those superabundance and productive forces under a common ownership and workers' control in order to develop these forces further, eliminate any scarcities that might still exist, and put all of this to rational use democratically in order to meet our needs and not the capitalist profits. Now, for all these reasons, actually, the, 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 the ruling class were never actually convinced by Hayek. And in fact, you could even say even Hayek wasn't really that convinced by Hayek, uh, because he actually retreated away from these economic arguments towards uh, more political arguments, moralistic arguments about freedom and choice and individuality. And that's what you'll read if you ever have the mispleasure, as I did for this talk, of having to read Hayek's Road to Serfdom. I really do not recommend it. Um, <laughs> unless there's another toilet paper shortage, in which case I will know where to go. Um, but the point is he complains moralistically in this. And, and later in life, actually, however, hypocritically, he and his acolytes had absolutely no qualms about supporting the iron fist of the Pinochet regime in order to crush the socialist government of Allende in Chile in order to install forcibly the invisible hand of the market. Now, instead of this nonsense, the ruling class turned in the, in the Great Depression, in the 1930s, towards the pragmatism, the so-called pragmatism of Keynesianism. This in itself actually is a tacit admission of the need for planning and the failure of the market. The ruling class couldn't handle what Hayek and his followers were suggesting in terms of the social consequences of mass unemployment, huge cuts to living standards. That's what Hayek was suggesting by saying, just let the market sort itself out and in the long run, everything will be fine. Keynes quite uh, humorously said, yes, in the long run, everyone's dead. Um, <laughs> but it, the point is that Keynes and Keynesianism, as opposed to this, seem to offer a solution based on managing and patching up capitalism. The, the bourgeois weren't interested in trying to justify or apologize for this free market that wasn't working, clearly. They were looking for a solution, a so-called solution, uh, based on uh, saving capitalism from itself using the state. And that's what we see in more recent crises. Today, with the pandemic, the most ardent defenders of the free market running cap in hand to the government, 
asking for uh, uh, money and loans and bailouts. In the wake of the 2008 crash, you had huge, giant financial monopolies coming to the state and the governments asking for bailouts, saying that they were too big to fail. Now, we've got to be clear on this question. Keynesianism and Hayekianism are two sides of the same capitalist coin. Both fundamentally defend the idea of the capitalist system. The differences were over the form of this system, not the content. It was about over degrees of how much capitalist state intervention versus how much capitalist free market, neither of which offers a way forward for the working class. Keynesian attempts to manage capitalism don't work, but neither does leaving our lives and our futures in the hands, or rather the invisible hand, of the market. Today, as I said, libertarians have largely abandoned any of these economic arguments, and instead they've reduced themselves to these moralistic, uh, individualistic prejudices about liberty and freedom. As I said, uh, you know, road to serfdom is their bible in this, in this respect. And the ideas that Hayek put forward today and mainly really just promoted by various right-wing, reactionary, well-financed think tanks and uh, free market institutes, funded ironically, most of the time, by the very monopolies that Hayek claimed to abhor. And they're used by right-wing politicians, obviously, as a fig leaf behind which uh, to hide, whilst attacking workers' rights and wages and boosting their profits. Now, in answer to these questions of individual freedom and so forth, We've got to say, we've got to tell the truth. There is no freedom for any individual within a system that is out of our control, within a system that imposes itself upon us, in a system where the economy and its laws do not work for us, but against us, where all the real decisions in society are not taken by us, but by unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats, uh, bosses, bankers, and billionaires. Real freedom, in this sense, Frederick Engels outlined, very astutely, he said, real freedom lies in understanding necessity. He's actually uh, paraphrasing Hegel in this respect. Real freedom lies in understanding necessity. What does he mean by that? He says real freedom does not come about from imagining ourselves to be free, you know, and, uh, and you know, I can, I can imagine myself to be free of the law of gravity, but I jump out the window and I'll be very brutally reminded that there is a law of gravity that imposes itself upon us. Real freedom comes from understanding laws and turning them to our advantage, you know, breaking the law of gravity, how? Not by uh, imagining that it doesn't exist, but by inventing machines that can fly, you know, airplanes and, and drones and so forth. These are what allow us to, to, to actually manipulate these laws to our own advantage. Today, we need to manipulate the, the laws of the economy to our advantage. And that we can't reform the laws of capitalism, though. What we need to do is understand the laws of capitalism in order to overthrow them through revolution and replace them with a new set of laws based on socialist planning and workers' control. That's the task that lies before us. That's what Engels called would be the leap from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. That's what we need to do. The only way to do it is organizing through revolution. So if you haven't already, join Socialist Appeal, join the international Marxist tendency and help us in this task.